Between 1970 and present, global production of plastic has grown tenfold, faster than any other mass-produced material. This revolution has been fueled by mankind's demand for cheap, lightweight, and strong materials used in industry, transportation, science, and consumer products. Plastics are ubiquitous in our everyday lives, from simple things like food packaging to items that often go unnoticed but serve critical functions. With an emerging understanding of how plastic waste affects the environment and few methods for reliably recycling the hundreds of millions of tons of plastic created every year, efforts to increase the lifespan of plastics are quickly growing. A new class of polymeric materials that has self-healing abilities may breathe new life into old plastics, helping improve the durability of plastic components in many applications. These self-healing polymers are able to repair damage without human intervention and could be used in complex systems where maintenance is expensive or even impossible. As the technology advances, Self-healing polymers could eventually become nearly as widespread as regular plastics and open new possibilities in fields such as biomedical devices, space exploration, and electronics. Humans have manipulated naturally occurring polymers for thousands of years, such as wool and cotton for textiles and plant sap for rubber. The earliest precursors to plastic were created in the second half of the 19th century, as scientists attempted to synthesize alternatives to expensive natural resources. Many of these synthetic materials were manufactured on a large scale for consumer goods, and some are still in use today. However, it was not until Leo Bakelent produced Bakelite that polymers and plastics really took off. By mixing phenol and formaldehyde at a specific temperature and pressure, Bakelent made a durable, heat-resistant, electrically insulating plastic that could easily be mass-produced. Not only did Bakelite quickly find widespread use in hundreds of applications, beginning mass production only a few years after its invention, it also turned heads in the scientific and industrial communities. Scores of new researchers began work in the emerging field of synthetic polymers, spurred on by funding provided by companies eager to capitalize on the next big discovery. By the outbreak of World War II, plastics had found their way into homes, businesses, schools, hospitals, and factories across the developed world. The war only accelerated plastic production, invaluable for military equipment, including parachutes and airplane windows. In the decades following Bakelite's invention, a fundamental understanding of polymers had allowed for the creation of novel materials that could aid in the war effort. In 1920, Hermann Staudinger had proposed that polymers were long chains of repeating units linked by covalent bonds into single molecules, an idea that gradually became widely accepted. Building on this idea, other scientists experimented with various units, known as monomers, to see what unique properties could be uncovered. Research on polymerization techniques and the effects of temperature, pressure, catalysts, and solvents unlocked the molecular mechanisms of polymerization and brought more complex polymers to market. The increasing use of oil for energy also energized plastic production, as many of the building blocks of polymers could be derived from crude oil. In the modern era, plastics and polymers are an indispensable aspect of life and can be tailored to suit a number of physical and chemical characteristics depending on their intended application. Because polymers consist of repeating monomer units, changing the monomer unit, or how many times it's repeated, can change the polymer properties. The large polymer molecules are held together by intermolecular forces, and plasticizers are often added to polymers to disrupt the intermolecular forces and make the bulk material more malleable. Bringing together multiple monomer types in various ratios or adding branches to linear polymer chains can also affect the intermolecular forces and thus the physical properties of the bulk material. With such a diverse array of factors influencing their properties, polymers naturally perform well in many applications. For example, low molecular weight polyethylene is ideal for lightweight plastic bags, 
while its higher molecular weight counterpart can be fashioned into incredibly strong joint replacements. As impressive as polymers are, they are certainly not without their flaws, and due to their prevalence, the failure of a polymer component or device can have catastrophic results. Heat, mechanical stress, exposure to UV light, or harsh chemicals can all weaken polymers over time. The failure mechanism of a polymer depends on the polymer itself, as well as its environmental conditions. Polymers exposed to mechanical stress may experience failure due to polymer molecules sliding past each other, while polymers exposed to UV light and oxidizing agents can fail by degradation of individual polymer molecules. This issue has been recognized for decades and has led to accidents with residential plumbing, medical devices, and energy and fuel transport. Alongside increasing knowledge of how polymers degrade, theories of polymer healing began to emerge in the 1970s. These ideas relied on the intrinsic ability of polymer chains to move within the bulk material, allowing them to remodel small defects. The first generation of true self-healing polymers was born at the turn of the century, relying on extrinsically incorporated factors in the polymer rather than the properties of the polymer itself. Microcapsules containing a healing agent, dicyclopentadiene, were immobilized within the polymer material. The polymer itself contained a catalyst that would react with the healing agent upon exposure. When a crack traveled through the material, it would break the microcapsules and release the healing agent, which would polymerize upon contact with the catalyst to create a network that would effectively stop the growth of the crack and fill in the defect. This method required no external intervention and could restore 75% of the maximum load of the material. This was further extended with encapsulation of components into two separate microcapsules, one containing initiator and one containing polymer and catalyst. In a similar manner, the fracture of these capsules would cause cross-linking of the encapsulated polymers and repair the defect. Although this could mostly recover the polymer's strength after a crack, the method introduced new difficult considerations. Incorporation of the microcapsules into the polymer would complicate the manufacturing process to ensure that microcapsules did not break before their intended use. The density of microcapsules per polymer volume would need to be controlled such that a propagating crack would rupture the microcapsules before growing too large. Microcapsules in the bulk material could also impact its overall mechanical properties. The self-healing properties of the material were limited, since, after a healing event, the capsules would no longer contain any healing agent. Promising encapsulation techniques, capsule materials, and healing chemistries have been investigated for this method. The second generation of self-healing polymers deviated from the previous method, and instead utilized reversible covalent bonds that could be healed with exposure to heat. Covalent bonds that could be reversed under equilibrium conditions, such as those formed by the Diels-Alder and retro diels alder reactions, had been studied for decades, and it was exactly these bonds that were used for the first intrinsically self-healing polymers. By incorporating furan and maleamide into the sides of polymer chains, a cross-linked bulk material could be easily synthesized. Defects in the material would involve separation of the furan and maleamide by a retro diels alder reaction, which could be repaired by holding the defect site closed and heating it to 120 degrees Celsius. This restored 57% of the maximum load of the material and could be repeated many times in contrast to the first generation of self-healing polymers. The use of different reversible bond chemistries expanded the range of conditions at which the polymer could be healed, including light or electrical exposure. In addition, working from principles of intermolecular interactions, further work developed polymers that healed at room temperature. These polymers contained molecules with high hydrogen bonding capacity, which would reform and entangle over time if the defect site was closed. With the benefits of such intrinsic self-healing polymers came drawbacks in the form of mechanical properties. 
A polymer whose bonds would easily reform with little input would also generally break relatively easily. Thus, an improvement in self-healing often came with a decrease in mechanical stiffness or load. The conditions required for healing of these polymers also limited their applications. The third generation of self-healing polymers relied on an approach similar to the first generation and had actually been conceptualized prior to the first generation. Instead of using microparticles, the third generation approach interspersed microscale channels containing healing agents into a polymer matrix. When a defect formed in the polymer, healing agent would flow from the channels to the defect site and polymerize in a manner similar to the microcapsule approach. The main advantage of this method is the more continuous distribution of healing agent throughout the polymer, which allows for multiple healing cycles, albeit with a lower demonstrated maximum load recovery. Although this approach was effective, the difficulty of embedding a network of channels within the polymer matrix limited the scalability of the design. The vascular network also introduced some similar issues as first-generation approaches, such as the trade-off between mechanical strength and healing properties. Since the inception of vascularized self-healing polymers, advancements in materials processing methods have made these channel networks easier to manufacture on a large scale. Currently, a fourth generation of self-healing polymers is under development, inspired by both intrinsic and extrinsic healing methods. This generation of polymers relies primarily on intrinsic healing via dynamic covalent bonds, intermolecular forces, or both. Extrinsic healing mechanisms are sometimes combined with intrinsically healing polymers to temporarily close a defect site while intrinsic mechanisms heal the bulk material. Overcoming the limitations of both intrinsic and extrinsic mechanisms remains a challenge, with combination polymers still having a relatively low maximum load and complex interactions between healing modes that can only somewhat be predicted. Innovative new techniques such as shape memory-assisted self-healing bypass some of these limitations and have successfully been used in industrial applications. Research into extrinsic and intrinsic polymer healing is ongoing and has resulted in novel classes of materials such as elastomers and vitrimers. Polymers fail in countless environments and under various conditions, often requiring intervention to prevent the failure of the entire system. In some instances where intervention is impractical or impossible, self-healing polymers could fill the gap. Polymers are currently used extensively in aerospace applications for thermal insulators, coatings, structural components, and adhesives, where they are exposed to radiation, extreme temperatures, mechanical stress, and impact from debris. Naturally, even a small defect in a component can quickly become a large issue for spacecraft. In many of these applications, the polymers have high mechanical stiffness, and extrinsic healing methods may be preferred to intrinsic methods to sacrifice as little of the mechanical strength as possible. However, extrinsic healing relies on healing agents flowing to the defect site, which may not occur at the extremely low temperatures of space. Conversely, Intrinsic healing mechanisms used in aerospace applications may be disturbed by exposure to radiation or atomic oxygen. While self-healing polymers offer tremendous potential for aerospace applications, their design must consider new and serious considerations. In the biomedical field, self-healing polymers must adhere to another unique set of standards. The presence of polymerization catalysts, especially metal-based ones, within a polymer biological scaffold is likely to have negative effects when implanted into patients. Intrinsically healing polymer scaffolds may be able to work with the body's stimuli, such as electricity or heat, to activate their healing, and a few such materials have been tested in animal models to moderate success. However, the similarity of biological molecules to commonly used polymers requires extra precaution to ensure that polymers' intrinsic healing mechanisms do not have off-target effects. Electronics and energy storage have, to a slight extent, already benefited from self-healing polymers. 
devices such as flexible electronics, organic conductors, nanogenerators, and thermoelectrics have traditionally implemented polymers. Self-healing polymers not only allow these devices an expanded functionality and durability, but may also power some of these technologies through their unique molecular properties. In their current state, self-healing polymers are suitable only for a select few applications, and it will certainly be no small feat to bring them to large-scale production. Whether self-healing polymers in the future will play a larger role in our lives, and just how large that role may be, is a multi-billion dollar question that many are attempting to answer. Thank you for watching, and as always, if you enjoyed the video, leave a like or subscribe for more educational content. Check out some of the other videos on the channel to keep learning more about biology, chemistry, physics, history, and many more topics.